Hello, Watch Enthusiasts. Now, in the last few days, France has been in the news for rather unfortunate circumstances after the, the very major fire in the Notre Dame de Paris, which is, which is a, a real shame for, for the history and the, the heritage of the nation. And so I think everyone's hoping it'll be reconstructed or restored in, uh, in due time, and also with, uh, with a, a due attention to quality and, and really to restoring this, this iconic monument of the nation. But considering the fact that all eyes are on France at the moment with regards to this, this, this heritage, I think it's important to speak about some of their watches. And so today I'd like to speak about five watches which have shaped their history, and these are wrist watches rather than pocket watches and earlier pieces. I will note that because, uh, because I won't be talking about uh, 8th, 17th, 18th and 19th century pieces, but I'll be focusing on wrist watches from the 20th century. And so with these five watches, or five watchmakers in the case of a couple, I think these outline the military history, uh, some of the social history, and some of the, the technological history of France, which, which I think is rather interesting. And so these do range from pieces used in a military format to pieces really which, uh, which were concerned with pure design. Now before I begin the video, I would of course like to encourage you all to like, share, and subscribe if you enjoy this video and find the content uh, within it interesting and useful. And also, if you're interested in more content, uh, and different content which otherwise wouldn't be available on the channel, then do follow me on Instagram at the address which is now on the screen. Where design is concerned, a real early innovator was Cartier in France. And with the watches produced by Cartier in the early 20th century, a real idea of what this brand's watches looked like, their design and their key attributes was, was created, and certainly through models which were incredibly famous like the Santos and also the Pasha later on, these watches became truly iconic. But amongst all of these icons, my favourite, and certainly I feel the one which has the most widespread accepted beauty, is the tank. And the original tank was conceived in 1917, before the end of the First World War, by Louis Cartier. And the name came due to the, the watch's resemblance with the state-of-the-art Renault FT-17, which is a very early tank, which, uh, which developed really into the style of tanks which we see today. And it was important because it was one of the very early adopters of a rotating turret, which, uh, which is uh, an interesting innovation, one which really changed the way tanks functioned. But certainly one can see that tank tread shape to the watch, especially in the early versions, with these, these quite defined sidewards elements, as well as, of course, that, uh, that cabochon crown seen on these Cartier watches, which gave a touch of, um, of elegance to this watch. And these early watches had those classical Roman numerals, as well as those breguet hands, which really have defined these watches, as truly elegant pieces with a strap which was almost integrated into the case, giving a very new aesthetic. And these watches were, were produced in very small numbers before 1920, with one being given to, to General John Pershing of the, the American Army in 1918, but really by 1920 only six watches had been sold, which does say a lot about the production of this watch in early years. However, in the 1920s this line blew up and with it its popularity. Two key watches, though, denote those 1920s, those early years, certainly of the 1920s, as very important stages of the change in the design of the Cartier tank. Because the, the first version released in 1921 as a redesign was the tank saint -Tré. and this version thinned the case and curved it around the wrist in this rather interesting form which has become very popular and also very collectible nowadays, with these watches selling at auction for several hundred thousand pounds in extremely good condition, with some being produced in platinum in the, uh, at the time. The dials also varied with these pieces, with Arabic numerals uh, offered as well as Roman numerals, which offer an interesting alternative, really, and the watch did take a slightly less classically correct form, one could say, than the original tank normal. There was also a second release, which was in 1922, which was the tank Louis Cartier, and this is probably the most popular version of the tank in terms of, of daily uh, purchases one sees, because this has the classical shape of the tank, but rounded off and made larger for a man's wrist. What I think is remarkable, especially with the Louis Cartier version of the tank, is that even today, almost a hundred years after its creation, it remains a very, very attractive design, and one which hasn't really aged. Certainly it does show something of its original era, but it still remains very much a contemporary design, and one with a very interesting charm, which doesn't appear to go away or even become quaint with age. And of course these watches have had a myriad of different movements produced, with manually wound versions, automatic ones with an interesting bubble on the back of the case back to allow for the rotor, and of course quartz versions too. But some interesting variants of the tank um, are, can be noted, such as my personal favourite in terms of, of being something very different, is the tank Agishi, which is a digital version, um, but not of course in the modern sense with screens, but rather with rotating discs, with a brushed front to the case, which was originally released in 1928, and of course we also saw models such as the, the tank Basculante, and this version allowed the whole case to be rotated, 
unlike a JLC Reverso, not laterally, but rather vertically, which is an interesting reinterpretation of what the tank was as a luxury wristwatch. And of course, there was enormous celebrity wearing of this, this watch, and really throughout, throughout history, because one sees individuals such as Andy Warhol wearing them in photographs, but also Jackie Kennedy was known for, for wearing hers, and, and of course was given one which sold at auction relatively recently. And, and it is quite remarkable to see a design like this in the form of the Tag Normal still being worn in the 1960s and in the present day with still the same success. And so I think as a design, very little can beat the tank in terms of its staying power in the minds of watch collectors. I feel that if one name needs to be cited as the greatest French watchmaker of all time, and indeed quite possibly the greatest watchmaker in general of all time, it would have to be Abraham Louis Breguet. And the company which followed him in the form of Breguet, through several generations of the family, whether that's the, the aeronautical side of the, the family business or the watchmaking, there were some quite remarkable pieces made. But the first piece I'd like to speak about, because of course there are several in this video which are produced by Breguet, is the, the Breguet 2516, as far as I'm aware, a unique watch which was auctioned by Christie's in 2011. And this is a piece which could very well be the first perpetual calendar wristwatch, in a form where the movement was originally conceived for a wristwatch. Now I say this because in the mid-1920s, Patek Philippe did produce a perpetual calendar wristwatch, however its movement wasn't originally conceived for that watch, so I do feel that in its category this was the first. And this quite remarkable piece in white gold is a true example of incredible watchmaking. And first speaking about the inside of it, it has a ten-line circular movement fitting into this, this non-circular case, with 18 jewels, and of course that perpetual calendar and moon phase, with naturally the Breguet overcoil balance spring, which was crucial to De Breguet's innovation. And curiously, this watch also had instant date change, and this was something which wasn't really expected at the time, and was a remarkable innovation considering the circumstances of a watch being produced in 1929 and then sold in 1934. It also had a bimetallic balance to compensate for temperature, and so really was ahead of its time in terms of being a truly cutting-edge perpetual calendar in its time, when before the war these really weren't very common at all, with only a few being produced. And so this watch, as far as we're aware, is unique, with its exquisite silver dial and its rather interesting case with screwed lugs. And so really it's a, it's a one-off piece which is a marvel to behold, and certainly deserves a place in this list of, of exceptional French watchmaking. Of course, speaking about Breguet couldn't end here, because of their military and also their aviation heritage, which was arguably even greater than their high horology realms in the early 20th century. And part of Breguet was an aircraft maker, so really one can see the connection. But when most people associate uh, images with the Breguet Type 20, they see the 1990s pieces and 2000s pieces, such as the, the, the 3800 version with the Lamania movement. And these flyback versions certainly do deserve a mention, because I think they still represent fantastic value even today on the used market, because at about four to four and a half thousand pounds with box and papers, these are an interesting alternative to something like a Zenith El Primero, with equivalent service prices if you're looking for a flyback chronograph. However, the watches I'd like to place my real emphasis on in this video are the pieces in the 1950s, because this is a history which is, is fascinating, but also ever-growing as more is uncovered, because there is very limited information uh, in some areas on the Type 20 watches produced for the French Air Force in the 1950s. And I've told this story before, so I've actually linked the full video on this to this video, so you can watch that if you want more detail. But really, I'd like to brush on this in this video, because it's an interesting story, and one which does show a real evolution through the French Air Force. When the Second World War ended in 1945, France rolled its military into Germany, into the Black Forest area more specifically. And here they captured a number of watchmakers, notably Hanhardt. And Hanhardt produced pilot's chronographs in the 1930s and 40s, and in fact remain a popular brand today, with some very interesting pieces still in their catalogue. But aside from that, they were a, a source of inspiration, really, for the French Air Force, the Armée de l'Air, to seek a new pilot's chronograph to, 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 to fit with to their, their pilots, and to allow them to be able to time their flights accurately and, uh, and regularly, without any sort of trouble. And that was really the genesis moment for the Type 20 specifications, which ultimately were released fully in 1954, with several brands taking up the, the aim to produce these watches for the French Air Force. And these demand a flyback manually wound chronograph with an accuracy of less than 8 seconds a day, and a power reserve of more than 35 hours. Also, these had to have the ability to operate correctly 300 times at the very least between services, and had to have two regist registers, one with running seconds, and one with 30 minutes for the chronograph counter at 3 and 9. Also, the diameter had to be around 38mm, and the dial had to be a high contrast black. Now, these watches were produced expressly for the Armée de l'Air, the Marine Nationale, uh, the, that's to say the French Navy, as well as the Centre des Seins en Vol, 
and that was the, the test facility for the French Air Force. And these have become particularly uh, collectible because it's stamped on the back with CEV on certain collector's models of the Breguet Type 20. And several brands approached this, this, uh, this commission, and more details are given in my specific video. And these were Vixer, Uricost, Doudan, and of course Breguet. Now, amongst these brands, Doudan still produce these in Besançon, and, and they're really rather wonderful watches in the modern form, with a modern movement, but still with the same functionality. So I'd strongly encourage you to take a look at those, because they are beautiful modern watches. But of course, Breguet has become the most well-known brand to work with these specifications, and as official watchmaker to the French Navy in 1815, it's understandable they would respond to this commission. And the Type 20s originally had Mette Tissot cases, um, but, uh, but were the reference 5101-54 in 1954. And some of these watches are known to have been produced in the early 50s, but were commissioned officially in 1954 for a run of 2,000 pieces. And the first generation models had an onion crown of 38.5mm case, as well as a fluted bezel rather than having full markings, and used a velgeur movement. Of course, the design did evolve with these watches, as the lugs changed shape, the bezels also developed numerals, and the dials changed as well to have those larger 30-minute counters with that luminous leaf-shaped hand for the chronograph. And this was a real change for the design, and has shaped what we now view as the Breguet Type 20 in its most modern form, because these hands have been adopted throughout the dial, rather than the more utilitarian look the watches took before that. There are also the versions with the iconic 15-minute counters for the chronograph, rather than 30. And these were aeronaval versions produced for the French Navy pilots, in order to be able to, to time other measures than one would have in other sectors of the army. And so this gave a different interpretation to the Type 20, and was, was produced from 1958, although, it, as I understand it, they were only delivered post-1960, and about 500 of these were made. And of course there were versions um, produced for the, the CEV, and these versions uh, came with a variety of different uh, models, with some having 12-hour counters as well, which, uh, which didn't seem to catch on being produced in very small numbers. Now there was actually a revision of the design produced in 1956 called the Type 21, and this version, uh, which was released in April of that year, provided a, a new set of specifications which were completely ignored by Breguet, but were only taken up by Doudan, which, which is the design which one now has on their watches uh, in the form of their more vintage-looking versions. And these were designed to change the, the, the graduations on the bezel um, from running forwards in, for the 12 hours to running backwards as a countdown bezel. These also need more, needed more reliable movements, um, and this was really to knock out some of the manufacturers which used older movements which weren't as easily serviced, and then one also saw these watches not necessarily requiring those 15-minute subdials which were later demanded um, as a result of, of them not yet being needed. But it does show the fact that there were different interpretations of the Type 20 and Type 21 specifications for what the Air Force needed. But certainly in any form, whether one looks at Doudan as a still family-owned business in France producing these, uh, these French pilots' watches, or the Breguet interpretation, which has nowadays become a real collector's market, one sees a very interesting view into that mid-century requirement for timing within the French Air Force. Now the next watch I'd like to speak about is not a single watch, and it's not French either, because it's the Tudor Submariner. And the reason I'd like to speak about these is because they came in the form of a variety of pieces which were used by the Marine Nationale of France, so that's their navy, for diving and, uh, and for purposes uh, under the sea. And the interesting thing with this watch is that Really, it was the needs of the Marine Nationale which helped to shape the Tudor Submariner into what we, we know and love today, and in fact has made the Tudor Pelagos, a watch which is, which is almost universally applauded for being a rather marvellous titanium diver. As early as the mid-1950s, one sees models from Tudor being used by the Marine Nationale, and notably one of their very early dive watches, in fact their first, the 7922, which was their 37mm wide dive watch, rated to 100 metres, with Mercedes hands and the, the style of Rolex dial, and this piece had a smaller crown and, and of course, uh, an off-the-shelf movement by comparison to the Rolex. And with its 100 meter water resistance, it wasn't really fit for, for all the purposes needed by the Marine Nationale. And so when it was released in 1958, the 7924, with its 200 meter water resistance and large 8 mm crown, replaced it in the inventories of this, uh, this National Navy. And so it allowed them to be able to use these dive watches for the missions they needed them for, and the larger water resistance was, was key, really, to this development. But very quickly there were issues um, with the crown, for instance, being bumped, thus allowing water ingress as a result of, of this damage. And so Rolex added crown guards with the reference 7928 in 1964. And these crown guards came in a variety of different versions, as was the case with Rolex, with uh, some, some eagle beak style uh, crown guards which were more pointed, as well as some more square ones. 
and with Tudor the early versions were more square, and in fact more protective, but uh, divers complained of them being very difficult to, to operate, especially with, gr with gloves due to their, their shape and the, the limited amount of crown to, to get real purchase on to do it to rotate it. And so with later versions one sees more pointed crown guards, and also uh, much more open crown guards to allow greater access to the crown, while still protecting it from a sharp knock. And these had a 10 year lifespan with, with a number of iterations, but by 1974 they were replaced by the, the black dialed version of the Snowflake model, as a result of a need for a greater legibility in murky water, or dark water as well, because this allowed larger hands with more luminous material on them, as well as a dial with much larger luminous markers. But with the exception of some unique versions produced, for example later on, such as this one on the screen now, produced in 1981 specifically for a diver who happened to be left-handed, the black dial versions were pretty much phased out within their first year, and this was due to the particular paint being used degrading incredibly quickly within the, um, the, the, the environment they were being used, with salt, salty air being around them. And so by 1975, this black dialed reference 7016 was replaced by the reference 9401-0, which was the blue dial version, the one which really became iconic and which inspired that Tudor Pelagos today. And these watches are interesting if they're from 1975, because this was the only variant which came with MN on the case back and the full year 1975. Other versions simply had MN and then 75 or 76 or whichever number it was for the year. And being supplied without straps, these watches were often fitted to these, these styles of straps which were made by the, the, the soldiers themselves. And so these straps were made out of, uh, out of cords from parachutes, and thus were made into these very very resilient and also elastic straps, which have become quite popular in recent years as an alternative to a NATO strap. And so really one has this image of these green striped straps with the yellow stripe running down the middle, and these blue, uh, somewhat somewhat aged dial Tudors really becoming the, the epitome of French dive watches. In the 1980s and 90s, several individuals really saw through the watch industry as something which was going through a temporary period with quartz watches, before returning to the appeal of mechanical watches, not necessarily for necessity, but rather for beauty and for enjoyment. And these included individuals such as Rolf Schneider from Ulysse Nardin, Gert Rudinger Lang from Chrono Swiss, and of course Jean-Claude Biver and, uh, and Jacques Piguet from Frédéric Piguet and Blancpain, who really were able to see this future, as well of course one can say uh, for, for Mr Hayek, who, who developed the Swatch Group as this, uh, this, this immense body of brands in the 1990s. And really, through all of these individuals, there's one missing, because the one individual who added to this was Alain Silberstein. And he, he was an architect who came at the watch industry from a very different perspective, rather from one which was involved with design and with colour. And through his watches in the 1990s uh, and either the, the 2000s, one sees uses of materials which hadn't been seen before, and uses of colour and design which were cutting edge and very, very new. Now, the company was founded uh, with Alain Silberstein's wife as well, between 1987 and 1990, and during the following years, the designs for these watches were unlike anything seen before. The cases were produced in a variety of materials, one saw by the early 2000s, titanium, bronze, steel, platinum, all these, uh, these materials being used for incredibly eccentric cases, with short, stubby lugs uh, jutting out at a right angle, very tall vertical sides of the cases, and the distinctive use of the primary colours, as well as circles, squares, and triangles for the crown and pushers on these watches. The hands and dials were also incredibly colourful and interesting, with these, uh, these, these bright, uh, bright colours on the hands and the various aspects of the dial. But also leather was used to some extent on certain models, with dials either featuring leather on them, or in some cases cases being covered entirely with, uh, with alligator leather, for example, which was something very innovative and very different, which clearly came from the mind of a designer and an architect, rather than a watchmaker in the traditional sense. But don't let this put you off these watches as not being horologically interesting, because mechanically there was such a wide variety of movements chosen to fit with the different cases and, and dial configurations. These lots of chronographs were produced by this brand during its years, and so of course the Vosges 7750 was used quite extensively in a variety of different forms, but also there were tourbillon calibers which produced remarkable displays of watchmaking on the dial, as well as really taking advantage of these watches as pieces of, of mechanical art. And one interesting calibre also used in some of their chronographs was the Frédéric Piguet 1185, an automatic chronograph with column wheel and vertical clutch, being a fascinating piece to be used in these, these incredible cases with double hinged lugs and these unique multicolour straps. And so I feel this is a brand which is underappreciated, and certainly these watches can still be bought as new old stock 
for surprisingly reasonable prices. And I think a lot of people shy away from them because they feel that they're watches which they wouldn't necessarily wear every day, but I think if you feel that you can pull one of these watches off, then they make fantastic collector's items, and I suspect will become more collectible as the years go by, as something which was a real chapter of innovation in the world of watchmaking, but also, uh, unfortunately, one which ended um, rather abruptly um, with the brand uh, being, uh, being put out of business. And so really, this is a finite period through which these watches were made, with an interesting design and, um, and certainly an interesting innovation behind them. And so through all of these watches, one can see different chapters in the history of French watchmaking, with that iconic design with the Cartier tank, to the incredible innovation of that, uh, that Breguet, as well as the military importance of those pieces in the, uh, in the aviation and nautical worlds, and then Alain Silberstein, which really formed a, a French uh, watch designer in Besançon, which, uh, which de demonstrated a new direction for watchmaking to take towards fun, rather than the serious world of horology which everyone had known. And so I'll conclude this video here, but do tell me in the comments down below what you thought of the video, and uh, do tell me whether you enjoyed it or not, because I I'm always curious to experiment with new forms of videos, and this was something which uh, I thought could be interesting, as something a bit different. And if you enjoyed the video, then do please like, share, and subscribe to help the channel, and also to be able to see more videos and content here in the future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Armand the Watch Guy, out.